So with the multiple options now available for the treatment of prostate cancer beyond chemotherapy, like we've been talking about, I think this represents opportunities for urologists to become increasingly involved in the management of these castration-resistant prostate cancer patients. So with that in mind, that obviously that whole paradigm now gets really thrown into many, many different ways. So there's, there's, there's the aspect of sequencing, whether that be individual drugs used in sequence versus combination therapy. You know, the problem there is that we're, we're, we're really hamstrung, if you will, by what is approved from a regulatory standpoint. I think many urologists, like we discussed, they love the different mechanisms of action. Clearly what's different is that each drug in and of, it, in and of itself has a distinct survival advantage. So the obvious question, which is well beyond the scope of, of, of our time frame here, is to talk about what these drugs would look like in combination. The problem is the trials, at least right now, because of the way the trials are set up, the way they're designed, the cost of doing such a trial uh, in, in an earlier space would be almost cost prohibitive. We are, we are really uh, somewhat limited how we can use these individual therapies, but, but that becomes a big, a big uh, hot topic. Then in terms of patient selection, do we have the, what is the exact profile? Who is the perfect patient? Again, trying to get to that answer. Then we bring in the cost of these individual therapies and it becomes important on a global uh, medical economics standpoint, especially as we are living in this, in this time where we have 16 trillion in debt and we're trying to ratchet down and trying to control the cost of Medicare, which obviously many believe will be the potential driver if it goes unregulated to cause the country to be in uh, worse economic times uh, you know, more than we already are. But from a, from a group perspective, where, again, where we as the urologists, we as the treating physicians are starting to incorporate that into our clinical practice, which is a whole different uh, set of circumstances beyond just being surgeons, uh, this becomes a challenge uh, for our administrative team. Um, you know, we're bringing in uh, Mr. S uh, Steve Dobbs. Steve is the uh, chief operating officer for the group in Tulsa, which is, a, again, a single specialty group. And, Steve's going to be able to provide us insight in terms of, from a business standpoint, what are the, what's the impact of having many of these therapies. But let's, let's move back just a little bit in terms of, Dan, what do you think? So we've got this castration-resistant prostate cancer. They've been housed under the urology umbrella. We now have therapies, whether they be immunotherapy, oral therapies, uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy, what protocols, algorithms are you trying to put in place down in San Antonio? What's the best model for how you believe these patients should be evaluated and managed? Uh, uh, Raul, I would tell you it's a moving target that the model is evolving. Uh, what we've tried to create <clears throat> is a multidisciplinary approach where we involve our radiation oncologist and an oncologist we have a physician champion on the urology side, which has been me in San Antonio, where we can kind of organize it all under one umbrella so that patients have a, uh, there's a, a center of excellence that's managing uh, advanced prostate cancer. And so that we can uh, offer patients clinical trials um, to see what the sequencing or what the, the best uh, pattern of giving these products is gonna be. Uh, currently, um, you know, again, we're kind of held back by what I would say is what's been approved by the NCA and at this point in time in trials. So what's considered pre-chemo space and post-chemo space, I would tell you that we are currently participating in two trials right now, uh, putting uh, Extandir and Zalutamide in the M0 slash M1 pre-chemo space. I know that uh, Zytiga is doing a combination study with, uh, 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 excuse me, with uh, Provenge to determine whether it's safe to give it with 
prednisone. So hopefully we'll have more information um, going forward that'll help us determine how to administer these drugs in the future. Brian, what about you? Do you have a medical oncologist that you routinely work with that comes into your office as a physician partner in Eugene? They're not a partner of our group, uh, but I do have a medical oncologist in the community that I work with. And I mean, I think the general point is, is every community is going to have a little bit of a different setup. You know, some urologists uh, can take this on and do it themselves. I think in other groups, maybe, you know, a one or two man group that doesn't want to take on, say, a Provenge infusion or something like that, although I think it's doable and they have a good relationship with their medical oncologist, I think that's fine as well. I think what, you know, what I've tried to tell my partners is what's important here is just providing the opportunity for patients to have these options. You know, for example, if you wait too long and a patient becomes symptomatic with their uh, CRPC, you know, you've taken, you've taken Provenge as an option off the table that's not available anymore. So the most important thing is just <coughs> providing your patients the options. So, Steve, in Tulsa, I know you've got 18 physicians now? We have 20 physicians 20 physicians. Now. You've got, obviously, urologists. You've got a radiation oncologist. Is there discussion amongst your urology partners in terms of bringing in a full-time medical oncologist? No, right now we work with about three different groups in town, so we haven't looked to growing that. We are looking at growing additional urologists in our group. From an administrative standpoint, if if reimbursement went to more disease management or episodic care, would you think about changing your business model? Would you evolve your business model to take advantage of that? Uh, absolutely. I think we're going to have to as things change and specialty drugs come out and new things get approved. I think the urology as a business practice is going to have to look at that and adjust accordingly. An example was Provenge. A year ago we weren't doing Provenge and now we are and it started a whole new process for us with systems and policies that the management team needs to put in place for the physicians. No, and, and again, I think, that's, I think that's very important. I think that uh, that's been the beauty about urologists forever. Urology is a specialty is that I think for the most part we've been very nimble. We've been relatively quick to adopt change. And again, I think that if we continue to believe that fee-for-service is going to continue to be here, I think we're, we're mistaken. And I think we all have to be bracing ourselves to, to be looking or at least to be willing to look at potentially different business models, different practice models, so that we will not marginalize ourselves as, as uh, reimbursement changes.